Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. A commenter left uh, this question, which I thought might be worth addressing in a video. The commenter says, I was wondering if you could make some videos on the philosophy of John Rawls and your thoughts on property owning democracy as an alternative to socialism. Um, and yes, I can make a video. I don't know if I could commit to multiple videos, but I can certainly make a video. And uh, I presume the reason he's asking me this question is because on Twitter, my uh, avatar is John Rawls. Um, hopefully most of you know that, but uh, if you don't, now you do. Um, and John Rawls uh, is a famous philosopher uh, in the liberal egalitarian tradition. Uh, his famous book was A Theory of Justice, uh, but a much more interesting book, in my mind, is this book he wrote uh, later in his life, Justice as Fairness, a Restatement, where he, it's a smaller book and it's, it's meant to be like, I don't know, like a companion to a theory of justice. Uh, and it's, you know, it's like he's had many years to hear a bunch of critiques and think about how he might want to revise the points a little bit or at least clarify them a little bit. Um, I mean, mostly it's just a re it's just a restatement of justice as fairness, which is his theory of justice that he lays out in his book, A Theory of Justice. That's the name he gives it. Um, but I, I like the book. Uh, it's an interesting book. So that's actually what I would I prefer to use when I'm trying to explain to people who John Rawls is and what what he's all about. Um, and I'll give a little jump in here. Um, and I'm not going to go like a super, I mean, I'm going to give basic 101 stuff. So if you're looking for like, Matt's got some real clear, clean, whatever stuff on Rawls. He's got some interesting nugget. I don't have interesting nuggets on Rawls. I have basic 101 Rawls. Now, I guess that one question people might have is what's the deal with the avatar? And the answer is, you know, when I started writing, even though I was using my real name, I was basically anonymous. And now that seems weird, but I had there was no if you were to search my name online, like just Google Matt Brunig when I started writing, there was nothing on the internet that would show up nowhere at all. There were no pictures, there was nothing. I didn't have anything. I was very much I was like a Linux guy. You maybe you could find if you're really clear, you could, you know, maybe you could find my email address and certain code that, that I had contributed to some Linux distributions, but like that it was pretty much it. Um, and I didn't want to put my face on there because, again, my pictures, there was no way you could see what I look like online. I never had ever posted a picture of me anywhere on the internet. Um, and so I was picking, you know, some philosophers and I thought, let's pick John Rawls. I also kind of thought one the picture's kind of neat the one that I picked but also it's kind of it's kind of a funny it's a it's a little bit of a trolly picture because I'm writing as a socialist even when I'm starting my my blog back in 2011 which was you know before socialism became kind of a hot topic in the US I'm writing about socialism yet I have a picture of John Rawls and a lot of people view Rawls as kind of being anti-socialist. They view him as being, you know, he's he's the he's the figure of the Democratic Party in a sense. He he, it, Rawlsianism is the philosophy of Obama. It's the philosophy of, I don't know, John Kerry, or you know, it's like it's that. It's it's liberal welfare state capitalism kind of stuff. And and it, isn't it weird that therefore someone who's out here as a socialist is putting John Rawls as his avatar? But as we will see in this video. John Rawls was not a uh, like Democratic Party style liberal. Um, he specifically says he's not. Um, and I, I, I should say, people who view that as his uh, as being what Rawls is, that he's kind of a milk toast welfare state liberal kind of guy. Um, the socialists, when I was growing up, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not that old, but the socialists that I would talk to thought that as well. So you would talk to them and they'd be like, oh, Rawls, he's, you know, and I would, and it was so baffling to me when I would hear that. And what I eventually figured out with some of this is that if you were to take a class of like a, a, a survey course on political philosophy, 
you know, you, they would cover Rawls for like a week or two, and you would read a few sections of a theory of justice, and it was often taught as like, yeah, this is kind of like a a, a first principles justification for welfare state liberalism of kind of like of the brand of the Democratic Party, that that is a common way that it is taught. Um, but that is not correct. That's not a correct teaching. And so in, in the same vein, as you might notice, it's both uh, antagonistic to uh, the libs and kind of antagonistic to a certain kind of socialist. So it's a perfect selection for my avatar, uh, in addition, again, to the desire to be somewhat anonymous. Um, okay, so let's jump into this book, Justice as Fairness. I'm going to be very brief, hopefully, I always say this, uh, on, on this. I'm just going to cut through to a few sections, and then I'm actually going to jump to a slideshow. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, so let's start here. Um, if you know the Rawls stuff, you know, he's the whole guy's like, uh, as, a, as a kind of expository device, as a kind of intuition pump to get your philosophical juices going, he says, imagine that, you know, you're deliberating with other people behind a veil of ignorance meaning that you don't know who you are in the society. You know you are a member of the society, and you can see the society, sort of, like you see all the people and the kinds of people and their varying abilities and genders and races, I don't know, whatever, right? All the different characteristics you can have. But you don't know who you're going to be. You don't know which of those people you are. Well, now, behind this veil, you have to make a decision, how am I going to structure this society? Right. And the, the intuition there is basically, well, I'm going to structure it in a way that's like pretty equal and pretty fair and, and so on. Because if I don't do that and the veil lifts and I'm in one of these like weak positions in society, then that's going to suck real bad. So I'm going to try to make these all the positions like pretty good. Um, and and uh, because I don't want to wind up in one of the bad ones. Right. That's like the basics. So I'm not going to go into all that shit. Instead, here are the after all that kind of reasoning and all that kind of stuff. Here's where we wind up uh, kind of an initial substantive thing here. He says, to try to answer our question, I turn to a revised statement of the two principles of justice discussed in theory. Theory is a theory of justice. Um, they should now read, you know, he's changed them a little bit, um, not too much. Each person has the same indefeasible claim to a fully adequate scheme of equal basic liberties, which scheme is compatible with the same scheme of liberties for all, and B, social and economic inequalities are to satisfy two conditions. First, they are to be attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity, and second, they are to be the greatest... They are to be to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society, which is also called the difference principle. Does he do more here? As I explained below, the first principle is prior to the second. Also in the second principle, fair equality of opportunity is prior to the difference principle. Okay? So this is principle one. You got to have equal basic liberties. Principle two... I don't know why he doesn't just do three principles. You'll see later in my slideshow. Principle two is you can have inequality in other things, but you can't have inequality of opportunity, and you got to set up the inequality in a way that maximizes the, the position of the worst off, right? So you can allow a little bit of inequality between like, you know, the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile, but whatever inequality you allow... One, there's got to be an equal chance to wind up at the 10th and 90th percentile. There's got to be an equal chance to do that. And two, you got to make those differences as small as possible. Like the position of the 10th percentile has got to be as good as, as you can get it or the first percentile or second percentile or whatever. It's got to be as good as you can get it, right? If any inequality introduced doesn't is not necessary to pump up the well-being of the bottom, then you shouldn't do it, Um that's the ba that that's my reading of it at least. Okay, so these are like general. This is very high level language. So what what the hell does he mean by this? So let's start with uh, the first one, which is the equal liberties. Um, now what's funny, and you'll see this here is, well let's go back. Okay, 
let's go back. As you can see, I'm very well prepared for this. <laughs> okay. So we got these three things here, right? Number one, equality of basic liberty. Number two, equality of opportunity. And then number three, all other uh, things should be distributed equally, except to the extent that distributing them unequally works to the benefit of the worse off, right? That's kind of how I see it. And they, and they go in that order, right? The problem here, and this is like, it's always it's like a nagging problem that really, you could tell he's always kind of bothered by it. He's always kind of trying to deal with it. And a lot of the stuff he has to write is trying to patch up this problem. And the problem is this, if you allow inequality here, if you allow for social and economic inequalities, other than equality of opportunity, that's a hard line for him on, the, on that. But after we've gotten rid of, after we've done the equality of opportunity bit, if you allow for inequality in income and wealth and stuff like that, which he says you're, there's allowed to be some of, when you, the instant you allow for inequality of income and wealth, now you're, you're really playing catch up to try to prevent that inequality from resulting in inequality in basic liberty and inequality of opportunity, right? So there's a kind of tension that runs throughout here. He wants to say, I'm a hard liner. Liberty, basic liberty's got to be equal and opportunity's got to be equal. Other things can be unequal. But then people are like, but if other things are unequal, that's just going to slap back and make opportunity unequal and slap back and make basic liberties unequal, especially basic political liberties unequal when you have huge differences in income and wealth, okay? So a lot of what he's having to do in all of this is kind of deal with that tension. So I actually think this is a good rundown of his effort here because basic liberties, you know, for a lot of stuff on basic liberties, there's not necessarily a tension, right? So one of the basic liberties, I think, I didn't review it for this article, is something like freedom of conscience, right? That we should have, you should have, be able to kind of like believe what you want to believe, practice, I don't know, think about like freedom of religion, stuff like that, right? And that, you know, there's nothing... You could have a very unequal society and still let people believe what they want to believe and practice their faith. and You know what I mean? There's nothing really that's at odds there. Where the stuff starts colliding with one another is when you're dealing with liberties related to political liberalism, the liberties related to uh, involving yourself in the political process. That's where you really start running into trouble, um, where income and wealth inequality seems to cut against that. So he recognizes that in this uh, section here. Um, and he tries to uh, uh, kind of correct for it or explain it a little bit by saying, look, when I'm saying you got to have equal basic liberties, that also means you have to have this other thing called the fair value of equal political liberties. Um, and he says, look, look, I know, look, radical Democrats and socialists will tell you that uh, these equal liberties in a modern democratic state are merely formal right? That, you know, in theory, yes, we all have a vote. We all can run for political office. You know, you can go fill out a form. In practice, social and economic inequalities in background institutions are ordinary, ordinarily so large that those with greater wealth and position usually control political life and enact legislation and social policies that advance their interests. How can you argue with that, right? And you know, what he says is, I, I hear you on that. So what I'm telling you is that, yes, in order to satisfy the condition of equal basic liberty, you got to find a way to somehow quarantine the inequality in income and wealth and things like that, which I allow some of. You got to find a way to quarantine that from the political system. Uh, you know, so he says, look, this means that... Uh, Whatever their economic and social position, all citizens must be sufficiently equal in the sense that all have a fair opportunity to hold public office and to affect the outcome of elections and the like. This idea of fair opportunity paralyzes the fair, parallels the fair equality of opportunity in the second principle, right? So he's recognizing this is the same problem you guys bring up with the equality of opportunity stuff, where inequality in income and wealth actually destroys equality of opportunity. I get it. It's the same argument now applied to like politics. Um, but what I'm telling you is, again, you got to try to find some way to like hive those off from one another. Um, 
And, he, you know, he's just like, I can't tell you how to do it, really. Uh, how best to achieve that kind of quarantining of that in the political institutions. I simply assume that there are practical institutional ways of doing this that are compatible with the central range of application of the other basic liberties. And then he does give some examples. Reforms to that end are likely to involve things such as public funding of elections and restrictions on campaign contributions, the assurance of more even access to public media, and certain regulations of freedom of speech in the press. Right. So he's like, look, yes, okay. In order to, you know, when I'm talking about having everyone having equal basic liberty, including things that are really very personal and that, you know, are not that hard to, to kind of give everyone this more difficult part of the political liberties, you're going to have to make really serious efforts to like control the election system, make sure all the parties have public funding, maybe prevent campaign contributions, uh, maybe change the media rules and whatever. And some countries have done this, you know, not so much in the U.S., but, you know, I hear vaguely, you know, that in the U.K., you know, you can only, you you know, you have to have equal time, you can only run ads for a certain period of time and the contribution... you know, other countries have have found ways, it seems like, to at least uh, uh, make the uh, political system a little bit less uh, corrupted by income and wealth inequality in the country. So, anyways, I thought I would mention that. That's what he means by the everyone having equal basic liberties. He means not only that we all have it, but also that we got to take steps to keep those liberties from being infected by the inequality of income and opportunity that he allows. Okay, so what's the next part? Remember, he's got equality of opportunity. This actually takes us back to where we were. Okay. Uh, we should, we should attend to the meaning of fair equality of opportunity. This is a difficult and not altogether clear idea. Its role is perhaps best gathered from why it is introduced, namely to correct the defects of formal equality of opportunity, careers open to talents in the system of natural liberty, so-called. To this end, fair equality of opportunity is said to require not merely that public offices and social positions be open in the formal sense, but that all should have a fair chance to attain them. To specify the idea of a fair chance, we say, supposing that there is a distribution of native endowments, those who have the same level of talent and ability, the same willingness to use these gifts should have the same prospects prospects of success regardless of their social class or origin the class into which they are born and develop until the age of reason in all parts of society there are to be roughly the same prospects of culture and achievement for those similarly motivated and endowed so that's his definition of equality of opportunity good okay so we gotta we gotta secure basic liberty for everyone that's step number one step number two we gotta have equal opportunity which means basically people who got equal abilities but unequal starting positions we gotta somehow make it so that they have equal outcomes right that that you know two people with the same abilities they can go out apply themselves the same way and both of them can become doctors both of them can become lawyers both of them can become business executives whatever right um so we got to get those and then we got the last uh, part of it right which is which is this bit the greatest benefit of the least uh, advantaged members of society the difference principle i didn't pull an extra clip on that one I don't think, but, you know, basically, if you're distributing other primary goods like income and wealth and resources and whatever, you're going to allow some inequality, but only insofar as it's necessary to benefit the uh, worse off in society, the, the least advantaged in society. Okay. So we got that basic structure. You got that basic structure. He calls it two principles again, as we'll see in my slideshow. I don't know why on earth he doesn't just call it three. That shit annoys me in a lot of stuff that I read where they're like, oh, it's three easy steps. And then step three is like five compound steps in it. And you're like, why don't you just call it seven easy steps? Um, but whatever. He now goes on to apply that principle like he says okay so here's my basic framework for justice now let's look at some institutional systems that exist in the world uh ways of organizing economies and and politics and let's see how those shake out how do those do those work with my theory of justice do they satisfy those three rules or do they not satisfy those three rules so he says let us distinguish five kinds of regime viewed as social systems complete with their political, economic, and social institutions. 
A, laissez-faire capitalism. B, welfare state capitalism. C, state socialism with a command economy. D, property-owning democracy. And finally, E, liberal, parentheses, democratic socialism. Okay? And he says, look, I want to be clear here. Um, I, I'm saying, you know, if these regimes are effectively designed to realize their achieved purposes, right, in their ideal structure and whatever, how do they work, right? So he's saying, don't come at me and be like, well, in practice, you know, it's always corrupted by this and that. He's saying that's not an unreasonable point, but for the moment we're doing philosophy, right? So let's stick to the kind of ideal. Like if you could put these in place in the way that they are supposed to work, right? And we're not saying it's going to get corrupted and all this kind of stuff. Does it fit with my theory of justice or does it not? All right, so he go, He just walks through them right here. Laissez-faire capitalism. You could think about libertarianism here. Secures only formal equality and rejects both the fair value of equal, poli equal political liberties and fair equality of opportunity, right? So it, it fails rules one and two. It also fails rule three, right, the difference principle, um, but he doesn't do that here. Welfare state capitalism, and this is the key. This is the first key where everyone, when I would talk to people about Rawls, I'd be like, you are, I don't know what book you're reading, but you didn't read Rawls when they would tell me, oh, he's like a welfare state capitalist guy. Welfare state capitalism also rejects the fair value of the political liberties. And while it has some concern for equality of opportunity, the policies necessary to achieve that are not followed. It permits very large inequalities in the ownership of real property so that the control of the economy and much of political life rests in few hands. And although, as the name suggests, welfare provisions may be quite generous and guarantee a decent social minimum covering the basic needs a principle of reciprocity to regulate economic and social inequalities is not recognized. Welfare state capitalism does not satisfy justice as fairness. It neither achieves equal political liberties, nor does it achieve equality of opportunity. It might achieve the difference principle with respect to income. It may achieve it with respect to income, but it does not achieve it with respect to wealth. And it violates rules one and two anyways. State socialism with a command economy supervised by a one-party regime violates equal basic rights and liberties, right? No political uh, liberties, not to mention the fair value of these liberties. So authoritarian socialism is out. So that just leaves us the last two, property owning democracy and liberal socialism. And he says both of these arrangements satisfy the rules of justice as fairness. They both have equal basic liberties, including political liberties. Two, they both have equal equality of opportunity, or at least they could. And then three, they would satisfy the difference principle in that they would achieve an egalitarian distribution of other resources in a way that you know maximizes the, you know, the, the least worse off or whatever, right? So for starters, and I'm gonna switch to the slideshow uh, here, uh, very brief. Uh, this is, I just, I think it's important to emphasize again, welfare state capitalism is a no-go, but also property-only democracy and liberal socialism is, are good to go. They are designed to satisfy the two principles of justice, both of them. So, this is, again, I go back to my avatar, why the avatar is kind of fun and why I like it. Because he, he's just, regardless of where he falls on it, he is saying, yes, absolutely, socialism is com consistent with my, with my theory of justice. It's not just Obama-style liberalism. In fact, I reject Obama-style liberalism. Because Obama-style liberalism has got nothing to say about who owns the wealth and capital of the nation. I reject that. You know, I'm not exclusively a socialist, but socialism works too. I'm good with that too, right? And he goes on and on here, you know, let's contrast these things. Um, but now let's switch, let's switch to the slideshow. Um, let's see here, should I view, do you like view slideshow, does that work? Well, I guess we'll see, all right. So let me, let me, I'm going to make this very simple for you. Three rules of justice. 
not two principles of, of justice, three rules of justice. That's what it really is. One, equality of basic liberties. Two, equality of opportunity. Three, limited inequality for other things so long as the position of the worst off is maximized, right? So basic liberties and opportunity, that's a hard line. Those got to be equal. For everything else, you can have inequality, but it's got to be super limited and only allowed insofar as it uh, in improves the position of the worst off, right? And these things go in this order, right? That these number one is the most important thing. Number two is the most, the second most, and number three is is after that. Um, I don't actually even agree with like th this per se. <laughs> like that equality of opportunity is more important than limited inequality. Now, I don't really fully believe all that, but you know, I'm not a full blown Rawlsian. What can I say? I just I, I like some of this stuff. Okay. Fair value of political liberties, we went over this. In order to satisfy the equality of basic liberties rule, you also need to have equality of political liberty, meaning equal right to hold office and participate in elections. Equality of political liberty, let me move my face here. Equality of, of political liberty is only satisfied if each person has a fair value of equal political liberties, which means that you have to make it so that inequalities in other areas, like wealth and income, do not effectively result in differential political power. Policies concerning election funding and media access could possibly do this, right? So this is kind of his rub on number one, as I see it. The most important rub on number one is he's, you know, I discussed it earlier as well. <laughs> Equality of opportunity. So let's get that definition. Two people with equal native endowments and who apply themselves equally should achieve equal outcomes regardless of their social class background. To achieve this, income and wealth inequality does need to be limited. So like I was saying before, and as we see here in the bottom paragraph, the, the, there is a conflict between allowing some inequality in income and wealth, which number three does, and securing one and two. And he's just kind of like, yeah, well, you got to deal with that. And you really just got to somehow in, create the society so that one and two are not infected by this. And one thing you have to do in order to, to accomplish that is you really have to be serious about the limited part of limited equality. You got to be serious about it. If you're not limiting inequality, especially inequality of wealth, then you're not achieving one and two. I mean, it's very clear as day. That that's his view. If you're not limiting, if you're not seriously limiting inequality, especially limit, limiting inequality of wealth, then you're not going to achieve one and two. You're definitely not going to achieve two. You're very probably not going to achieve one. But you should also do things beyond that to try to insulate one and two, you know, create good universal education for everyone, to try to get equality of opportunity, create campaign financing rules and stuff like that to try to get equality of political liberty and stuff like that, right? Okay. And then we get the five systems. Laissez-faire capitalism violates all three rules. Violates all three. He doesn't talk about three, but clearly it violates number three as well. Welfare state capitalism also violates all three rules. And that's, I think, is a funny element of this is when he's going through this, you would think, oh, well, he might say, look, at least welfare state capitalism, you know, it satisfies one of the rules, but not one of the other ones. And that's why he rejects it. No, it violates all three rules, right? It violates rule number one because the wealth, it, and the reason it violates all three rules is because of the wealth inequality that it allows, Welfare state capitalism is not concerned with the redistribution of capital and wealth or keeping that equal. And because it's not concerned with that, th with that it doesn't accomplish equality of, of basic liberties and equality of opportunity, right? State socialism, of course, authoritarian socialism, he's not happy with that. And then in property-owning democracy and liberal democratic socialism, you could satisfy all three rules, right? He, does ne he never says he's for one or the other. Now, he does spend a lot more time on property-owning democracy in the rest of the book. Uh, <laughs> not that much time on this part. Um, but he never, he never says one or the other is his preference. He, he leaves it open. He says, that ah, depends kind of on your political culture and, sh and, and shit like that. Um, and maybe like empirical things. So what is my take on the two, right? This is what the commenter asked. What's what's your deal on you know property owning democracy versus democratic socialism? Rawls seems to think both are okay. Um, and so let me, I just have two slides on that. Um, first, let's just restate why they're so important here, right? The fundamental reason that property owning democracy and democratic socialism satisfy the Rawlsian theory of justice while welfare state capitalism does not, right? We know why laissez-faire capitalism doesn't. Come on. 
fucking libertarian. It's just massive inequality. We know also why authoritarian socialism, which he's calling state socialism, doesn't, because then you don't have the political liberties, right? We know that. But why doesn't welfare state capitalism at least kind of get us there, maybe, right? And the fundamental reason why POD and DIMSOC satisfy the theory of justice while welfare state capitalism does not is that POD and DIMSOC have an egalitarian distribution of productive assets, i.e. wealth, while welfare state capitalism does not. That's the key. That's the linchpin of the whole thing. That's why POD and democratic socialism, that's why they're allowed, right? He kind of retcons their egalitarian distribution of wealth. Is that the right word? He kind of uses that to then go back up to equality of basic liberty and equality of opportunity. He, but it's, that's the, the key turning point in all this is that the wealth becomes the key to equal opportunity. It becomes the key to political liberty. And it's also separately a thing that has to be distributed. And if it's distributed very unequally, it's very unlikely to satisfy the difference principle, which only allows unequal distributions to the extent that it improves the position of the worst off. Now, the difference between these two right? They both achieve the wealth equality of a sort. They both achieve wealth egalitarianism that he thinks clears the bar for his theory of justice. But property-owning democracy achieves wealth egalitarianism through widely dispersed private ownership, right? So you can imagine a nation of small owner-operated small businesses and sole proprietors and stuff like that, right? So it's, you got the private wealth, but it's very widely dispersed, it's all mom and pop, you know? It reminds me of Catholic distributism. It also reminds me of um, like kind of like the antitrust people like who are real into that, you know, the neo-Brandesians and the Jeffersonians and whatever. They're basically just advocating property-owning democracy, though very few uh, seem to do so from like a Rawlsian perspective, but that's basically what they're slotting into. Um, Catholic distributism, the same thing. Uh, as I see it. I mean, obviously that precedes property owning democracy, but you know, that's supposed to, the appeal of that is supposed to be, you know, Hey, we get the egalitarianism, which seems to be uh, very much required by uh, a, a certain uh, Christian ethics and as uh, certainly like a uh, uh, Catholic social teaching, we get the egalitarianism, but without the dreaded socialism, which seems uh, antithetical maybe. Uh, but you know, so that's, that's that. And then democratic socialism achieves wealth egalitarianism through collective ownership. So you can imagine a worker co-op, which, which is an example he gives in the book, or a, you know, it's a social wealth fund, I think would satisfy that as well, um, which is one of the things I've advocated. So that's the difference. Widely dispersed, they both have wealth egalitarianism, which he makes very clear is key to satisfying justice. One does it through widely dispersed private ownership, the one does it through collective ownership. The other does it through collective ownership, okay. So which one should you prefer? For me, I think that democratic socialism actually is better. And I think, you know, if you follow the logic of the argument in the book, really democratic socialism is where you're going to wind up. And they have two kind of reasons for this, though there, there are more, and, and other people have written whole books about this, which I'll, I'll mention very briefly at the end here. Um, the first point that is very persuasive to me is that property-owning democracy aims at widely dispersing wealth and capital in order to avoid too much concentration, right? It's not too much concentration, right? Dim, democratic socialism does the same thing while achieving more wealth equality than POD achieves, right? Property-owning democracy is like, well, instead of having, you know, the... Instead of having, you know, like these big, big, instead of having like Elon Musk, you have like, you know, 10,000 extra small business owners or whatever. But unless you're in a world of, of where everyone's a sole proprietor and they all own their own means of production, a 40 acres and a mule type arrangement or whatever, if that's, unless you're in that situation, you're still going to have a lot of wealth inequality, right? In a small business world where all the companies only have like 10 employees in them or whatever, there's still, unless the 10 employees are owning the firm together, in which case it's socialism, there's inequality there. There's still like a business owner and like, yeah, it's not as, a, it's not like a case where the top 10% owns 80% of the wealth or whatever we have in the US at the moment. It's maybe a lot 
more dispersed than that, but it's still the case that your everyday worker or whatever is not owning very much. But in a democratic socialist society, at least the one I advocate using like social wealth funds and state-owned enterprises and to some extent perhaps co-ops and stuff, you get a much more equal distribution of wealth and holding all else equal. If one system achieves more wealth equality than the other, then under rule three, it should be preferred. So what's rule three? Rule three, limited inequality in other things so long as the position of the worse off is maximized. So if you hold all else equal and Dim Soak achieves more wealth equality than POD, then Dim Soak wins. And not only does Dim Soak win, it, not only is it better, it is required by justice as fairness. It is required by justice as fairness, right? Because the maximin the third principle here says you got to constantly be on the lookout for how to make the worst off's position the best, right? It's not like you clear the bar and the, the position of the least advantage is like, it's good enough. It's now it's over the bar. So it's good enough. And you satisfy justice as fairness. No, it's got to be the best system for the worst off. And so if dim soak is a, even a little bit better for the worst off than POD, because it achieves a slightly more egalitarian distribution of wealth, then Dim Soak wins. And justice as fairness requires Dim Soak. Two, practically speaking, in the current technological environment, and I'm open to possibilities that technologies will change, and in the past, technologies would have been different. You know, this is maybe <coughs> a little bit of my uh, uh, historical materialist coming out. Um, in the current technological environment, a small business dominated economy is not going to be as productive as a big business dominated economy. I do not think that if you take the production of our society, which is often done, in, and we have a mix of firms, we have some small businesses, we have some big businesses or whatever. I do not think that if you were to take all of the, or, or even most of the production that's done by large firms in the US and spread it out across thousands of tiny little firms that you would, I, I, I think you will suffer a production penalty if you do that. I do not think a thousand small firms is gonna be as productive as one big firm for a lot of the stuff that we produce. Right, thinking about producing, you know, whatever cars or even like retail, like chains and stuff like that. I think those firms are more productive in the sense that they get more output out of the same amount of input. And this is because of economies of scale, efficiencies, and th things of that sort, right? So, if the only way property owning democracy works and it, the only way it achieves its wealth egalitarianism, is by saying basically everything's got to be a small business, then I think it's going to have less production, right? That it's, it's, select, its way of achieving wealth egalitarianism is also going to bring down GDP. And that might still be better than the alternative of welfare state capitalism or certainly laissez-faire, you know, it might be. But if dim soak allows you to also have the efficiencies of big firms while having wealth equality, for example, through a social wealth fund structure or a worker co-op structure or whatever, then it's, then it's the winner, right? Because it's got more GDP and the same amount of equality. Actually, it's got more GDP and more equality. More GDP plus more equality means the worse off are better off than the alternative that has less GDP and less equality. You see what I'm saying? So to my mind, democratic socialism gets you more output and it gets you a more egalitarian distribution, not just of that output, but also of uh, ownership of the productive assets of society. So it wins. That, that, that's my view at least. Now, there have been some uh, recent writings on this, actually. Uh, in 2000, uh, nine, 2017, William Edmondson, great guy, by the way. I've emailed with him uh, before. He wrote a book called John Rawls, The Reticent Socialist. 
And uh, in it, he he argue he basically just uses this same book that I did, and but he's you know he's a legit philosopher, uh, and he he says that he thinks that Rawls is is like a legit socialist, and he's got all sorts of interesting uh, arguments on it. I think one of his big uh, uh, moves here is to talk about what's necessary for achieving for really achieving equal basic liberty. So I think he leans much more on the political argument, saying, look. The kinds of inequalities uh, that are present, even in property-owning democracy, are not really compatible with the fair value of political liberties, right? Um, so if they're not, then they violate rule one, <laughs> and all that's left is the socialism. Um, and he tries to argue not just that that's logically required by the book, but he also then, I think, takes an extra step to say, I actually think Rawls was a legit socialist. He just didn't want to say it for all sorts of persuasive, for, you know, he's operating in America. He maybe just doesn't want to go down that road. One of the interesting nuggets in the book is that, and I didn't know this, Rawls was uh, like a disciple of James Mead, who is a very famous uh socialist in the UK. I've cited Mead before in my uh, social wealth fund paper. Uh, when I saw that, I was like, okay, all right, that is interesting. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> or not, I don't know, but a little bit later, two years later, um, Katrina Forster, I think it was in this book. I'll be honest with you. I have not had a chance to read this book, but I know uh, from other sources and in, uh, in just in the ether, I think I follow her on Twitter or whatever. She uh, had access to Rawls's papers. She's a Harvard professor. Rawls worked at Harvard, and she went through some of his papers. I think that were unpublished, and and it seems like she found pretty persuasive stuff that Rawls was not uh, was not personally a socialist, um, even though he acknowledges in the book that socialism is compatible. Um, with uh, his, his theory of justice. For me, I don't really care what Rawls was or wasn't personally. I'm, you know, what I'm interested in is the theory. Um, I would say, regardless of what he, where he ultimately decided to go with it in his practical personal politics of sort of moving the ball forward, it's very clear in the book that socialism is compatible with his theory of justice. It is one of the two things that is compatible with it. And it is very clear to me that between the two things that he says are compatible with his theory of justice, democratic socialism is the better of the two. And also, in parentheses, if it is the better of the two, then it is actually required by his theory of justice. Because his theory of justice is not something where you clear a hurdle. You actually have to be the best at maximizing the position of the worse off, right? Rules number one and two are kind of hurdle-based rules, right? Where as long as you achieve one and two, you're over the bar, right? But rule number three is a, uh, is a, is a scalar, right? Is that the word? Is a scalar uh, kind of variable, not a binary. And so you got to maximize you got to maximize the position of the best off. So among the things that satisfy one and two, whichever one does the best for the worst off is the only one that actually satisfies three and therefore is the only thing that satisfies his theory of justice. That's how I see it. So... There you go, 101 on Rawls, and I, this is, I think, the first time I've ever laid this out. Uh, I may have written a piece at PPP slightly about this back in the day, but, but yeah, th this is basically what I think about it. I have not read John Rawls in 10, 15 years. Um, it's not like uh, something I, I, I return to. I spend much more time reading socialist thinkers. But I'm associated with him because of the Twitter avatar. And now you know sort of uh, the intellectual uh, reasons why, um, you know, that avatar is there. So anyways, thanks for the comment. And um, there, let me get my face back, right? Is that right? There we go. Thanks for the comment. I should have put my head on here a little bit earlier, but thanks for the comment. I like these kinds of comments. I probably should do more content like this rather than the coding shit. Uh, but 
Uh, so I'm going to try. I'm going to force myself to stop doing the coding stuff and do shit that might be interesting to more than like a few hundred people. So give me more questions like this and maybe I'll use those as a peg for future videos.